Right, there's a, a slight change to our programme. Our next speaker will be uh, Chairman of uh, the RSGB Board, uh, Steve Hartley, G0FUW. And uh, he's going to talk about the Tim Peak effect and life after Principia. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Oh, great. I do like to check that everybody's awake at the beginning of the talk. You may drop off during it, but you know, at least if we know everybody's alive at the beginning, we stand the chance. Right, well, thank you to uh, AMSAT for inviting me along today. Um, I, first, I should make it clear, for those that don't know me, I am an amateur amateur, what I describe as an amateur amateur. That is, I don't have any professional contact um, with radio or radio communications. Um, entirely self-taught, been a radio amateur for about 30 years, and I feel a bit of a fraud being here, because I've never made a satellite contact. <laughs> so, <laughs> however, I did listen to Tim Peake on my own two-metre radio station at home, so I can say that the Tim Peake effect touched me as well. So what we're going to talk about today, um, I guess as RSGB chairman, um, I'm in the firing line for doing things like this, um, but I think more importantly, I was directly involved in some of the schools that uh, Kieran's been talking about, and um, I continue to be involved in trying to push this agenda forward, and uh, I'll talk about some of the things we're going to be doing later on. So those are three key questions that um, I'm going to be dealing with today. First of all, what, what did, it's a bit like that Monty Python sketch, what did the Romans ever do for us? What, what did the RSGB do to support this mission? Well, we'll talk about what we did. Um, after the event, you know, what does it look like now? What, 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 what does it feel like? What, what are the impacts? And um, finally, you know, what are we going to do next? Um, and hopefully that will sort of build on some of the things that Kieran's been talking about and, and hopefully John will be able to talk about shortly. So, what did we do? There's a whole host of things. Um, I think it's fair to say, from the very beginning, when I first heard about this project and when the uh, others in the RSGB heard about it, we realised this is not an RSGB project. This was something where the RSGB was a partner in a big thing. And you heard Kieran talk about the, the relationship with the European Space Agency and, and the UK Space Agency in particular. Um, we saw this as, from our point of view, that ARIS were taking the lead, that the schools would have a big say in what happened, where and when, um, but also that the RSGB could play a supporting role in that. Uh, and that's really where we came from. So what did we do? Um, the very first thing, and this seems like an age ago, um, when Kieran approached us and said, we need to do some sort of competition to try and get schools lined up for this. And... Uh, the RSGB was involved in that. We did not get involved in the selection process, I have to say, just in case there are any teachers here who are disappointed their school wasn't chosen. That's, can't blame the RSGB for that one. Um, and we did get quite a lot of stick in Scotland, actually, as to why weren't there any Scottish schools um, involved. And there was a very good technical reason that the satellite just didn't pass over that way. It, was, uh, it, it, it had to be, and, and the technical challenges of trying to point the beams down from uh, Aberdeen or something would have been, I think, just one step too far. The next thing that we really got involved in was negotiating a call sign um, because Tim didn't have a US call sign that would qualify him for a, a reciprocal license so he couldn't just get a UK call and there is this issue about the license, the UK license says you can't operate from an airborne vehicle um, which kind of puts uh, sort of some limitations on it shall we say. However, as the National Society and the fact we work with Ofcom, um, we were managed to, to sort of negotiate, twist arms, call in favours, call it what you will. And they took a very pragmatic view, um, mainly looking back to the Helen Sharman days, of saying, well, we gave her a call sign, so it's a bit difficult not to give Tim one. So GB1SS was, was born through, through that process. Um, we also facilitated some of the stuff with the special event calls and, and all of that as well. 
And I have to give, give credit that so this is a huge team effort all round, but Heather Parsons, who's our communications manager, um, the Principia thing really took over her life for uh, a big part of last year. Um, trying to get line up schools, um, the radio amateur community, um, the space agency, and the media. You know, all of that took a lot of work to try and get that message over and maximize the impact. In terms of the actual contacts, um, the RSG attended every, every one of them, uh, but even before that, uh, we attended a couple of the launch events. We had people in London, in Belfast, and in Cardiff. We did try to get to the one in Edinburgh, but for some reason it just didn't happen. Um, and the idea was there to get amateur radio right in at the front when the, 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 the launch event, to make sure that people were aware of what was gonna happen. We certainly liaised with all the schools and um, there, there was lots of good interaction there. Um, and to show how important this we, it was seen, the president uh, was at virtually all of the schools and a couple that he couldn't make, the general manager was there to, to fly the flag at high level. We also had the regional team, local clubs and uh, the youth committee were represented. So there was a lot of resource went into to providing backup. Um, I think all but one maybe two of the schools, the, the video 21st century uh, hobby uh, was shown and uh, that has had fantastic acclaim from across the world. I think it's been translated into about four different languages now um, and just recently we had a, a thank you from the Polish Amateur Radio um, Society to say this is great, it's going to help us to promote the hobby in, in Poland. Um, that had great effect not only with the youngsters but with parents as well who kind of never bumped into amateur radio so again this spread of the word uh, went beyond just the contact in the schools but also to the, the, the parents and again um, I, think, I think I've got the picture but there's one picture where Heather is stood in amongst the whole sort of world's media uh, at Sandringham um, and she did a fantastic job in, in keeping all those people on message uh, and, and pointing out that this wasn't CB for example yeah. couple of holiday snaps it's a bit dark, but that's the launch event in Cardiff. You can see it's a very orderly affair uh, at the Welsh Assembly. He uh, lined everybody up and, and showed the stuff on the screen. And uh, um, I have to say, I suspect there was a lot of people rooting for, for the, uh, the, the, the Soviet um, uh, Soyuz to, to, to take off safely. Um, this was the RSGB stand at Cardiff. Um, Steve Thomas then was a, an, a, a regional manager, gave up his time to be there. Uh, and represent the, the society and the hobby. Um, and Mike Jones uh, took, I think, the day off school or, or college to be there, travelled all the way from, Cardiff, uh, from Cornwall to Cardiff. Um, and all of that, again, was supported by the RSGB. We tried to replicate the, the equipment um, that was going to be used, you know, the, the Kenwood and, uh, and all of that, to show people that this wasn't just some huge laboratory sort of setup. It was, you know, low-key amateur kit that was going to be being used. Mike met some odd people from space on his travels. I did work, when he rang me and he said he dropped a clanger. I wondered what the heck he was talking about. But, um, anyway, that, that, was, uh, that was some of the people he met. Um, Mike was there to try and show that not all radio amateurs are grey-haired, middle-aged, older men in sheds, shall we say. Um, and he did a great job of, of just fronting up. And you know, he, he, I think he was only 17 at the time. Not many youngsters would stand up in front of an audience like that and promote the hobby and make the link to the fact that you can get into ra uh, radio-related industry and careers through amateur radio. So, you know, full credit for Mike for doing that. Um, he attended quite a few of them, as did some of the other youth committee members. They did a great job. I think he nearly fell off the stage twice, but that's a different story. Okay, in order to make the contacts, obviously we needed radio amateurs, and the ideal situation was to have children from the schools licensed to be able to call CQ and to, to conduct themselves in an appropriate way. I think most of the schools, I'm not sure if all of did, particularly the primary school, but I think most of the schools ran foundation classes to try and get somebody qualified um, before the contact. And Sandringham in many ways set the bar really high in that um, these three young ladies were the, you know, three passes out of three with very minimal training, uh, they got the book, they had a couple of hours uh, training uh, and they sat the exam and they passed. Um, 
the RSGB was able to help that. We do the exam administration. And because this was in a closed environment in a school, it wasn't open to the public, we were able to sort of oil the wheels and get the results processed pretty darn quickly. Um, so I think there was you know, a few days uh, between sitting the exam and having the license in hand. Um, and just the, the, there was somebody who said, oh, well, yeah, I suspect you just gave them you know, the license. It was all a done deal. Not all the schools managed to get uh, children through the exams. Um, because of the tight time scales, even when being able to oil the wheels, we couldn't do a re uh, we didn't have time to do a reset. So uh, in some cases, Kieran had to uh, to do the CQ bit. Um, and I think at Powys, um, one of the local radio clubs provided it, a youngster who was licensed that could do that, which was which was great. Another sort of holiday snap here. Um, I'd, 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 don't mean to harp on with Sandringham, but there's some really good sort of uh, lessons we learned there. Um, this is Jessica, shortly after speaking to Tim Peake, which I think was her third ever amateur radio contact, having done two as part of the foundation practicals. She was then speaking to space, and then back down to earth with a bump, 40 metres, special event call sign from the school uh, shack. Um, she put out a few calls, not a lot happened. Um, she eventually hooked up with somebody. As soon as she mentioned that she was Jessica who'd just spoken to Tim Peake, well, the pilot began and it just went <laughs> on and on. I think it was 40 or 50 minutes before she drew breath. Um, um, and the chap there in the middle, it, it, um, I forgot his name now, he's from the Verulam Club, who were the club who helped out with the school. Um, he was there to supervise, but you can see he's not doing really, he's not required to do very much. He just sat there and, and made sure it was all, all good. The other one, which is worth mentioning there, the little chap in the corner is Oliver. Now, he wasn't involved in the contact uh, 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 or any of that. He, he didn't do the amateur radio course. But he was sat there and, and, and he was tapping out Morse on the, um, on the table. And the RSGB president, John Gould, was there and said, you appear to be able to do Morse code, what, what, what's that all about then? And he said, oh, I was on holiday with my parents, you know, I was a bit bored. And there was this book in the corner about Morse code. So I read it, I learned it, and I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody ever tells you that kids don't, are not interested in Morse code, there's one that certainly is. <laughs> Okay, what else did we do? Well, we were very conscious that the ISS pass was only for about 10 minutes. And uh, we wanted there to be the opportunity to build this into a day or a couple of days of activity that would bring amateur radio right into the heart of the school. Um, so we decided that you know, we'd offer them, and it wasn't, again, it wasn't an imposition, it was offering additional activities. You know, some of the schools were really good and, and arranged things for themselves. Others sort of went, oh my God, we've got to do something, can you help? Um, and we were there to, to sort of fill that void. Um, all of the schools had a radio amateur or contact with um, radio amateurs um, to make the bid in the first place, because it was part of the deal, was you had to prove that you could, uh, you, you could actually follow this through and make it happen. Um, in a couple of cases, um, that didn't necessarily see itself through the, the period up to the, to the contact, some things had changed. Um, I was certainly involved with the Bristol one where the caretaker that you saw there, you know, he was great at getting it going, but when he said, right, you're going to have to staff a 20-person build-a-thon and all the rest of it, he's oh, just one man here. So we were, managed, we were able to get some of the local clubs involved and coordinate all that activity, and, uh, and the RSGB regional team were really good at doing that, and, uh, and uh, you know, full credit to them for, for being able to tap into those resources and, and bring that together. Um, what we ended up doing, we, we, so we wanted to make this uh, an active thing, not, not standing up talking as I am to you now, but actually getting kids with hands-on amateur radio and, and learning. That was important. Um, so what that ended up with was a, a briefing pack and a radio kit, which would introduce them to radio communications, because a lot of these youngsters had never bumped into amateur radio or, or anything like it. So they needed to understand some of the jargon. What does CQ mean, for example? Why do you talk in such a funny, strange way? You know, and like all hobbies, we have our own language. 
And we also wanted them to do something hands-on. So that, that's what we ended up with, a briefing pack and a radio kit. This is where I start getting cold sweats. I had this phone call on a Friday. Steve, do you remember we were going to do some support for the uh, ISS project? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? Um, and we wondered if a build-a-thon would be a good idea. And like a fool, I said, oh, yeah, that'd be a great idea. I've, I've run a number of build-a-thons with youngsters, the British... Uh, the, um, the Bath Scientific Institute have this thing with the young scientists, and we've done a couple with them. It's really, really, really popular. So I said, but if you were going to do a build a thumb, what would you build? So quick as a flash was, well, I'm sure you'll come up with something, make it happen, see you, and the phone went dead. So I rang back and said, how long have we got to sort this out? They said, oh, about eight weeks. So in eight weeks, we had to go from this bright idea of doing a build a thumb to actually delivering it at the first school. We didn't have a kit, we didn't have any tools, we didn't have any people, but it was going to happen. And, and again, it chimes with what Kieran was saying. When you ask around, there are lots of people willing to help out. And for me, that is the crux of the hobby, is helping other people to learn and to, to develop and, and, and enjoy the hobby. Coincidentally, I'd been talking with Tim Walford from Walford Electronics about you know, what if we could get a school kit together? Um, with no real plan, it was just a, a, one of these things that you bounce around. And that was the brief we'd set ourselves, that if you were going to do something for a school, it had to be very buildable. You know, no fancy um, pro sort of knowledge required, uh, fairly limited component coat, certainly no coil winding, because in my experience that's the bit that takes a long time and has the opportunity to go very wrong. Um, it needed a good quality, well spaced out PCB so that it could be populated easily and quickly. I say guaranteed to work, no radio project is guaranteed to work, you all know that, but something that was you know, a high, high chance of it would work, so repeatable, no tricky alignment, but it had to have that wow factor, it works, yes, I've built something, it's great. Um, but also, if we could, a link to amateur radio. Oh yeah, it had to be cheap. <laughs> Schools are not flush with money, so we needed something that was going to be, uh, be under 10 quid was our, was our sort of aim. And in good Blue Peter fashion, this is one I built earlier. This is the Rodway receiver. Um, and as you can see, it, it sort of ticks the boxes of th that design brief. Um, they came in just under the £10 mark, and that included a battery and a pair of headphones. Um, and a real team effort again. Tim Walford gave us the circuit. It's copyright to Tim, but he, he, he said you can use it as many times as you like. That, that, that's fine. Um, Giles at RSGB headquarters designed the PCB, and as you can see, it's nicely set out. It's all, all silk screened and, and all of that. And my colleagues at the Bath Buildathon crew helped to put the instructions together. So there were step by step photographic things, a bit like the old Heath kit things where you could tick off as you fitted each part. And there was that nut, nutty question of how are we going to pay for this? <laughs> They're only 10 quid each, but we need about 200 of them. And uh, I don't know if Sir Martin's here today, but the RCF, the Radio Communications Foundation, funded those kits, so we didn't have to charge the schools for them. Uh, it, it came free gratis, so uh, really, really uh, pleased to, to thank the RCF for, for that as well. Um, did it work? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, and I'm talking about the project in, as a whole rather than just the radio kits, but... Most schools use the kits uh, and hosted special event stations. So lots and lots of young people and parents saw amateur radio for the first time, realised that this was quite fun. It wasn't some boring sort of science thing that they, they switched them off. Um, and we had, that was my test. Lots of smiling faces. That usually says things are going well. When people are smiling, then, then you know that things are good. And there's some of them. Um, and squeals of joy. Um, you know, I've been a radio amateur for 30 years, I'm still learning stuff. And one of the things I learned was that you can get really, really excited about a top band AM contact across the room. <laughs> you know, I wasn't expecting that, as the song goes. If you're 13 and you've built the receiver and your mate's talking into the microphone and you can hear them wirelessly, that's quite exciting when you do it for the first time. And these kids were blown away by it. They thought it was brilliant. 
And if anybody tells you that children haven't got a span of attention these days, absolute rubbish. These kids sat for hours sitting over the printed circuit board. We had to kick them out for lunch at times and, and, and they came back. And some of them would stay on to do fault finding and, and that until they got the thing work that we determined to make it work. Um, so it was brilliant. What's that led on to? Some of the schools have now got amateur radio clubs that they never had before. A number of them have run foundation courses, not only for the pupils, but also for the staff, so that the, the science teachers can get into this as well. And we've had quite a number of requests for more of these kits, um, that the original batch have gone, but we're, we're, we're now looking to, to get some more made. So, what does the Tim Peake effect look like now? Where are we now? Well, there was certainly a lot of media interest during the contacts. I think every local BBC thing, like the, the Bristol one that you saw there, uh, had some coverage. And it's not often we get national coverage on something like the One Show. That was great. But, quite frankly, that's sort of gone now. I don't think we can, we can rely on that. But it did provide us that platform. For me, the biggest thing it did was to provide access to schools. Because if we don't start recruiting young people into this hobby and into electronics, the UK is in a bad place. And uh, trying to get through that door is quite difficult. Schools are very busy, they're quite understandably secure these days. Um, uh, one of the ones I went to, I think it was harder to get into than some of the prisons I used to visit when I was working. So um, it, it, it really is quite difficult to get in there. This gave us a focus that got us through that first hurdle. So that was really, really valuable. And uh, I think we can still play on that. You know, that, that um, you know, the Tim Peake effect will last a little bit longer with the schools than with the media, I think. The science teachers that I met, certainly I went to five different schools, the science teachers were absolutely overwhelmed by the quality of the support they got, the professionalism of these amateurs, um, and the fact that the kids were engaged with what they were doing. Like, We've been trying to get them to do this for ages and you've, you've got them doing stuff, that's fantastic. So they saw the value in it as well. And I, as I say, I think we've got more young members through the RSGB and to the hobby as a result of this. So there is hope for the future. When we're all sort of packed up and gone, there'll be others along to, t to carry on for us. Which brings us on to say, well, what do, how do we keep that momentum going? Um, one of the things which we're planning at the moment, um, which is sort of rushing up towards us, there's going to be two Principia follow-on conferences organised by the Space Agency, uh, one in Portsmouth and one in York. And we're planning to have amateur radio being writ large uh, on that. There's about 500 youngsters going to be at each one, and there's two days at each venue. So potentially about an audience of 2,000 youngsters again, some of who will have been in the involved, but some who will be fresh. Um, come in December, we've got the Yota Month, which is Youngsters on the Air, organised by the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1. Um, where for the whole of December there will be a special call sign available to schools and youth, young um, youth groups to promote amateur radio and get youngsters on the air. So a great opportunity to run some more radio days in schools and we're, we're certainly encouraging the, uh, the, the, the ISS contact schools to, uh, to join in that. As I said before, we're producing more of the school radio kits. Uh, that, pro that project's well underway. Uh, but also we're putting together a toolkit um, because some of the clubs that wanted to get involved didn't have 20 soldering irons and 20 sets of snips and all, all the things that you need. So the RSGB board have agreed to fund what we call a pop-up workshop. So it's going to be a kit bag with all that in it and if a school or a youth group wants to run a build-a-thon we will dispatch it and then get it returned afterwards. So that, that's another thing that we were able to do. And finally, the, the Training Education Committee uh, have already made contact with the schools that were involved. Um, they're keeping them warm and using them to sort of bounce ideas around to, to get uh, a, a way forward. Um, but the Schools Link project, which that relates to, is trying to use a slightly different approach and to say, right, schools, you have to do this stuff. It's in your curriculum, your specification, call it what you will. Here's how we can help you to do it using amateur radio. So you have to do, for example, Ohm's law in physics. Well, hey, you know, you could do that as part of your, your, your foundation or your inter, uh, intermediate practical things. We can help you with this. And it'll be a practical demonstration of what's possible. 
and also it will enrich the learning experience that we've seen with these youngsters. Um, I don't think he's on there. The, the, the lad at the top there, right in the middle with the thumbs up. I don't think he stopped smiling all afternoon. He was absolutely in the zone, as they say. But lots, lots and lots of good stories there. So that's what I came to tell you about. Are there any questions? No. Obviously. Sorry, what was that one? Someone encouraged little Oliver after having learnt Morse to do his foundation test. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, we're very lucky with Sandringham School. And I, I, I presume those that were here yesterday probably heard it from the school. The headmaster is a, a very active uh, radio amateur. So anything that can be done to uh, sort of encourage them uh, in the school is dead easy because he just says yes. Um, I think it's, he's the only head ma it was the only school where the headmaster's got a 40 metre dipole going into his office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, um, so yeah, you know, be before he does assembly or whatever, he's, he's, he's there working Brazil or something, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure it, it, the opportunity's been there, whether Oliver's taken up or not, I, I'm not entirely sure, but, uh, but Sandringham are one of the schools that have now got an amateur radio club, and I believe they're now taking part in the, uh, the RSGB club contest uh, sort of every Tuesday night or whatever, which is, again, great to see. Well, any, further, any further questions? One, one here, Trevor. Um, Thank you. Um, Steve, we've spoken about um, uh, STEM a little bit in the past, haven't we? But, um, uh, you talk about the difficulty of getting into schools in the UK. Um, I'm a recently registered STEM ambassador. It took me six months to get into my local secondary. Um, but I finally have, and they're really interested and really excited. Um, have the RSGB got any plans to uh, point people who are interested in getting involved in schools um, at routes like that to get in? Absolutely. Uh, the, the Schools Link project is working with um, the, the STEM net and uh, schools themselves and the guy who's run it is a retired teacher so he, he speaks the right language if you like he recognizes the, the difficulties and the reasons behind them um, so yeah the idea is when that project goes live and it's probably going to be sort of this time next year so that for the the school term that starts uh, in september 17 um, all of those things should be lined up to say this is how we approach it this is how you do it um, so yeah, it, it, it is difficult, but that, that's the route we're going. And, and I've certainly made a, uh, links with STEMnet and, and uh, it's a really useful sort of way in, but it, it's, not the, it's not a silver bullet, if you like. It's, it's, it's something you've really got to work at. Uh, and we're trying to oil the wheels as best we can. Okay. Any further questions? <laughs> no further questions? Okay, one final thing before I, I, I close. Um, we're, we're, wasn't on the slide because it's a fairly recent thing. We've, um, we've got the, um, the Yota International Camp uh, in the UK next year, um, which is something that um, is going to be absolutely fantastic, I'm sure. Um, it's going to be at Gilwell Park and uh, we're hoping, fingers crossed, and God knows whether it will happen, um, but we've got that wouldn't it be a good idea if moment that um, Kieran's going to try and get us a, an ISS contact as part of that thing. The one that's just happened in Austria, they had a telebridge contact. We're hoping if we can to get a, a radio contact, but um, um, so fingers crossed on that. Where there's a will, there's a way, as they say. Um, so again, we're promoting things through that, and there's going to be about 100 youngsters from 15 countries uh, here next August. Um, so, you know, watch out for that and uh, if you can support it and, and get behind it, it'll be fantastic. That's at Gilwell Park? It's at Gilwell Park, first week in August. Um, we have an expert from Gilwell Park. Excellent. Scouts at the back. Fantastic. And we're talking to Steve there, the radio scouting people, and um, it's going to be, I'm really excited about that. I'm quite nervous about it as well, but it's going to be great. So if there are no more about that, I've got one more thing that I need to do, um, which uh, is to present this. Louis Varney, who I'm sure you all know better as G5RV, um, in 1956 he donated a cup to uh, the RSGB um, and it's awarded for advances in space communications. So, um, 
when, when I saw the picture, I was expecting something about the size of the FA Cup, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit nearer to an egg cup, but anyway. I, highly prestigious award, and um, I, I'm going to have to read to, from the citation for this because um, I don't want to get anything wrong. Oops. All hooked up. Um, I'm sure you all know, I'll have to do it for you, um, the name of Wouter Wengler, um, who. Uh, <laughs> sort of waiting in the wings. Um, I, I'm told uh, was sort of been working on on satellites for many years now, and uh, uh, had his first launch in 2008, um, and more recently with the FunCube uh, actually designed some of the boards, and uh, that was launched in 2013, and continues to operate flawlessly to this very day. Um, and the bit I, I really wanted to read out, read out was this is what the uh, what the satellite community have said when they uh, nominated him for this trophy. His enthusiasm, technical knowledge and his willingness to work for the good of the amateur radio satellite community around the world, together with his commitment to the STEM outreach, makes him a worthy recipient of the Louis Varney Cup. Ladies and gentlemen, Buta Venkla. Very well done. Thank you very much. So we have over here for a photograph. Super. Thanks. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your time. And if, uh, again, if there's any further questions, I'll be around at coffee. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> yeah.